You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends, LLC, the Grand Hall Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You may find all your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find Leaders and Legends at AllIndianaPodcastNetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle and me at leadersandlegends.net. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is David Stewart. Mr. Stewart is a prolific author, and he turned to writing after a career practicing law in Washington, D.C., He also served as a law clerk to Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Lewis Powell. And he is probably makes us double digits when it comes to Ivy League League graduates here on the Leaders and Legends podcast. We should give a shout out to uh, someone Mr. Stewart knows, and that is former guest Ted Bohm. Thank you, Mr. Stewart, for coming on the podcast. It's my great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Mr. Stewart has just released a new book. And it's called George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father. And I told him before the podcast began that this is the third book of his that I now own. And this is the first one that was sent to me for free. Mr. Stewart has um, mixed feelings about it. So I promise to buy another one of your books in the near future. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you. Thanks. His other books are The Summer of 1787, which examines the creation of the United States Constitution, and Madison's Gift, Five Partnerships That Built America. Those are the two that I have. And he's also written a book on Andrew Johnson and the fight for Lincoln's legacy. And he wrote a book on Aaron Burr, a rascally uh, figure to say the least. And it's called uh, American Emperor, Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America. So your new book is on George Washington. In my view, he's the single greatest American who ever lived, despite the recent attacks on him. And let's say, let's be candid here and legitimate examination of his legacy. What led you to write this book? And what about him did you not know that you now know? Well, that's, I was drawn to him because as you've noted, I've done three books on the founding era and it just seemed to me I'd been writing around the main event, which is Washington. Uh, He's clearly the most important part of of that time. And it's, I wanted to understand him better. In particular, I became transfixed by the fact that uh, he won four key elections in his life uh, as commander in chief of the army and as president of the constitutional convention as president, our first president, uh, and he won re-election also. So yeah, of course he won them, but he won them unanimously. And that was no more common in the 18th century than it is today. And frankly, it's just amazing. And I wanted to understand how he did that. Um, and one of the f- reasons I think is what you, your second part of your question, which is what surprised me Uh, I was surprised by his interpersonal skills. We tend to think of him as this massive guy who, you know, married a rich woman and uh, was crazy brave in battle, which he was. Um, But I think he had an extraordinary gift for connecting with people. Uh, He had real emotional intelligence and emotional accessibility 
uh, he was quite open about his feelings. He, he wept in public on a couple of occasions. He was not embarrassed about that. And I think that talent for building a connection with the people he was dealing with uh, was very key to his success. You mentioned this imposing figure. Talk a little bit, please, about Washington's physical presence, especially in relation to the, the common, the, the, the normal stature of the time. And we're talking mid to late 18th century. Yeah, he's a big guy. He was 6'2", um, never heavy. Some of the portraits make him look kind of paunchy, which he was never. He was slender, but strong. Uh, and he, he was a commanding presence. Uh, he had what John Adams called the gift of silence. Um, and he, he, he avoided talking too much, which was it can be a, a very smart thing to do. I, I stumbled upon a wonderful uh, very obscure article that actually analyzed all of the members of the Virginia Regiment during the French and Indian War, which he commanded. And of 500 or so of them who were recorded there, uh, the average size was five foot five. Mm. So he's nine inches taller than the average person. Uh, there were, I think, six other men in the regiment who were six feet or more. Um, and to be honest, they were not an impressive physical bunch. Uh, you know, life was hard in the 18th century. And, you know, they had a few who were missing fingers and cross-eyed and, uh, you know, it, it was not uh, a time when it was hard to avoid misadventure as a human being. And Washington was a terrific figure of a person. So uh, it clearly, was it was was a useful talent now i want to kind of go through his life somewhat chronologically because that makes the most sense but i do want to ask you your book is called george washington the political rise of america's founding father two things about your subtitle the use of the word political and we tend to think that our great state statesmen our great figures are above politics in some way which is of course always farcical. Usually our greatest statesmen have have profited and, and prospered through politics. But I want to ask you about that part of the subheading. And then I want to ask you about the use of the word father, singular, as opposed to one of the founding fathers. Uh, he, uh, he was a great politician. And that is the theme uh, of the book, because as a young man, he's not. Um, he's actually a bit of a catastrophe. And he has to go to school and figure out how to be a great politician. And, you know, he always insisted, whenever he got some giant new job, he'd say, oh, you know, I know I'm not equal to this task. And, you know, I, I just hope you will, you'll appreciate that I'm doing the best I can. Um, very humble sounding. And, you know, he had to know this was baloney, that he was, he was really good <laughs> at it. Um, and certainly everybody else in the room knew that. But you know, through history, we've sort of bought, bought that act um, and, and have sort of accepted that you know, he wasn't really a politician. He was a soldier, he was a farmer, he was a, you know, a, a man of integrity, but he was actually a terrific politician. And so I wanted to give him credit for that and, and study that. The other thing is uh, you were asking about calling him the founding father, you know, uh, the patriarchy was in full view <laughs> in this era, and you know that's who ran the country. Uh, and I do think, you know, without Washington, it probably doesn't happen. You know, the United States, um, there really was nobody of his stature. Could somebody have turned out to be of that stature? Uh, the candidates are thin on the ground. Uh, we weren't that big a country. We, the talent pool wasn't that deep. And uh, I, I think he's entitled to be called the father of his country as, you know, he was then. Was there anything about George Washington, I think you called him a catastrophe for his early years. Was there anything about his early to formative years, let's say before he starts his military career, 
that marked him out for greatness. His schooling was sparse for sure, especially compared to his brothers who had a formal education, I believe in, in Great Britain. But other than maybe his size or, and how he stood out that way, was there anything that made anyone think, you know, this guy's a man on the come? You know, I think when every, whenever people were exposed to Washington, beginning when he was a young teenager, he was very big for his age and people always thought he was older than he was. Uh, they were impressed. Uh, he had a good manner. He was, I, I was surprised to discover so many people referred to him as affable. He, he was easy to get along with. And he had a, an air of command. Um, he, people have spent too much time worrying about his relationship with his mom. But there's no question that his mother also had an air of command and that he took after her. And it, it was fairly natural to him. Uh, and, you know, when you're the biggest kid in the group, when you're the tallest man in the room, uh, it's a little easier. And I think that uh, helped shape him and, and did mark him out. I think people expected more of him. Um, I have a very tall brother-in-law who always insists that uh, tall people have to be more honest because everybody can see if they're cheating. <laughs> well, my, you well, know, I hate to say right. that my, my, my son is six foot seven. And, uh, I always joke that like, don't, jo don't join the infantry son. You, you, you're, you're not going to go very far. I, I guess my other son, who's about six foot four actually did join the infantry in the military, in the army and served two tours in Afghanistan, but he came back, but is, is height, size, looks, intelligence, all these sorts of upbringing, sort of like familial connections. These are the things that marked people for success, not, not just in 2021, but back in the 18th century. Is, is that sort of leadership and that mantle of responsibility something that Washington actively sought? Oh, he was crazy ambitious. Yes. Um, and he, he, said throughout his life that the most important thing to him was to stand well in the eyes of his contemporaries, that his reputation was the most valuable thing to him. He was not alone that way. That was an 18th century thing. And they talked about it quite openly. It, it didn't mean that, you know, you were the most, uh, I don't know, scandalous or the, the most uh, sensational person, but it meant you were thought worthy. You were thought trustworthy. And, um, so, so that was very important to him. And, and part of that is to have positions of responsibility and equip yourself well to do your duty. Um, and he was very duty driven his whole life. There are very few things that are more political than the officer corps of any given service in any given country at any given time. Was George Washington's martial abilities and inclinations, a terrific sort of training ground, training course for his political rise? Yes, because he learned how to, how to do it wrong. Uh, in the French and Indian War, he, was in, he, he had a couple of great early innings and was catapulted to command of the Virginia Regiment. He was 23. It was in, you know, commanding people 10 and 20 years older than he. And uh, then everything went south. Uh, he had a couple of very unfortunate battle experiences um, where his men suffered and his performance was, was not great. Um, and then he got stuck in this frontier war against the Indians on the western frontier of Virginia in the, in the Appalachian Mountains, which... I mean, he couldn't win. I mean, his soldiers were lousy at it. The Indians were great at it. And for three years, he basically, you know, every day was agony. Um, he got testy about it. He got short-tempered, uh, short um, reckless. Uh, he, he ticked off all of his uh, superiors. Uh, he tried to jump the chain of command a few times and got caught at it. Um, and he left the armed services at the end of 1758, basically because he had fouled the nest. I mean, he, he was not going to have a career 
in the British military or in the Virginia military, he was done. Um, he still had a residue of people thought, well, geez, he's, he's an awfully brave guy. But everybody who was in a position to help him basically wanted him to go really fast and, and very far <laughs> away from them. Washington is born, if I recall, in 1732. The French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, starts in 1756. So not long after the start of that war, which we can argue actually began, and correct me on this date, 1754, that's when Washington went west to try to get the surrender of the French at a fort, I can't recall, but it started there and then uh, cascaded yeah, into du this. Fort Duquesne, and yeah, 1754. Fort Duquesne, thank you. And so then it this this, and I mean, if you wanted to be determinist about things, you could say that Washington's venture into Pennsylvania in 1754, and correct me, Mr. Stewart, if I'm wrong, you can draw a straight line to that from that all the way to the Congress of Vienna in 1815. If you want to be a determinist about history and go, this happened because this happened because this happened. But before the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War is finished, Washington is out. But let me ask you, is his quest for which he was ultimately denied, I think at least twice, for a commission in the British Army, if he had received that? one of the greatest counterfactuals in history. Yeah, it's a great what if, because, um, you know, it might have been General Washington commanding the Redcoats um, against the Americans. Uh, and it, you know, he would have had 16 years as a professional soldier being trained extremely well in the British military and likely would have been a very difficult adversary. Um, so, yeah, I think that could have been uh, a bad outcome for the Americans. Uh, but it, once he left in 1758, that, that wasn't going to happen. Talk to the leaders, please talk to the Leaders and Legends podcast audience about why it was so important to Washington to receive a commission. He, was a, he had a commission in the Virginia militia that he had received through the governor, I think, Din, Dinwiddie. Yes. and and the uh, Virginia legislature, but he wanted to be a full-on officer in the Royal Army, in the British Army, tried multiple times, was denied multiple times. Why was it so important to him to receive that commission, and how did he feel when the British basically told him to go away? Well, colonials were generally sort of despised by the Brit professional soldiers in the British Army, and I. Uh, unless he had a full commission, uh, he was going to be viewed in that category. And frankly, he would not ever rise. I mean, he couldn't. Uh, he had a couple of mortifying experiences. He was a colonel and there were captains who held royal commissions who were giving him orders. Mm -hmm. And he did not care for that. Um, he, he found that mortifying. Um, so he knew that the only way to become a significant military figure, and he was not going to do anything unless he could become significant, uh, was by getting that British commission. And, you know, it, it just was not on the cards. The Seven Years' War ends in 1763, and it's not long after that that the period we call uh, the American Revolution begins quickly in 1765. And then we have a series of acts in which the British are squeezing the American colonists to help pay for, A, the war that expelled the French from North America, for purposes of this discussion, not the entire continent, but re removed the French threat from the British colonists, which they were deathly afraid of. We forget about that, how much the colonists despised the Catholic French and their Indian allies. And... Uh, we most of us know the history pretty well, but how did Washington react when the Stamp Act and the Tea Act and the Sugar Act and all these, uh, the Townsend Acts, all these acts that were passed by the British Parliament in which the American colonists had no say? Uh, 
How did that radicalize Washington and is, is radicalized the right term? I think it is, and you've described it well. He uh, goes into the House of Burgesses, the Virginia colonial legislature, as soon as he leaves the armed services in 1759 and serves for a number of years, slowly gaining a little respect. It's not natural for him to be a legislator. That's not his sort of comfort zone, but he, he's learning how to be a political figure and he, he is advancing. Uh, but then when we get into the contention with the British, uh, he starts zooming up the, the ladder in the House of Burgesses. And some of it, of course, is because he has a military background and people kind of like that if things are going to get nasty. But a lot of it is that he is uh, angry. He is implacable and he is strong in his opposition to the British. Uh, we, we sometimes, I think, forget that, that as early as 1769, he was saying, you know, this may well end up in war and we need to be ready for that. And as things continued to fall apart, he seemed prescient and, you know, strength is an appealing quality in a time of strife and he, he projected it. It was a calm strength, but strength. This is also a time when the committees of correspondence were started and people from other parts of the United States, or I guess I should say the colonies, started to talk with one another because the, the anger towards British Parliament, not towards the king, George III, but towards British Parliament at this point was palpable. How did Washington start to associate himself with the Virginia revolutionaries, and that'd be George Mason, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, Edmund Randolph, and others. And then how did they get connected with the folks in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts that were clearly driving the break with Britain? He, he knew all of these, the Virginians, uh, and actually he knew a lot of people around the colonies. Uh, much more, many of the Americans were uh, provincial figures. They never got out of their own colonies much, but Washington had because of his military service. Uh, but he takes a leadership role right from the beginning. He has a pattern in his career of hooking up with uh, very smart men <laughs> who were very good with a pen. Uh, Washington was very modest about his abilities as a, as a writer, and he would always reach out for somebody he thought was much better than him. Uh, and he, the first person he did this with was George Mason, who was a next door neighbor. Uh, Gunston Hall is right next to Mount Vernon. And they put together uh, an association for uh, a boycott of uh, uh, imports from Britain, which the, uh, Washington took to the House of Burgesses, got adopted. And it became his plan. Mason stayed home because he was feeling sick. And they did that again uh, in 1754, at a, excuse me, 1774 at a key point when things are really uh, going downhill in the relationship with Britain, uh, they res prepare the Fairfax Resolves, which is the series of resolutions uh, very truculent resolutions uh, challenging the British and saying we're not going to uh, accept these taxes that we've had no part in, and basically saying we're prepared to go to war over this. Again, Mason wrote it. It was Washington's ideas as well as Mason's, but when it appears in all the newspapers around the country, the name at the top is G. Washington, because um, he's the guy who, who sponsored them in the uh, legislature. Uh, so he gets great visibility from this. He does have a military reputation, which people know. And there is a connection going on between the different colonies through the uh, committees of co correspondence, as you say. But the key moment is when the First Continental Congress meets in 1774. 
And Washington is there as a leading uh, Virginia delegate. Uh, he's not just some guy who's there. He, he, he's one of the leaders and he does uh, stand out. He's still tall. Um, he's still got a military background. Uh, and he's still got all of his other talents and the other delegates all notice him uh, and uh, take his measure and he does well. He also seemed to have had a significant reputation for personal bravery. It, it's it's shocking that he wasn't killed as many times. I don't know how many horses he lost, how many times his coat was shot through in some of the French and Indian War uh, conflict battles. But but he had that reputation of a man who wasn't scared, who was brave, who was willing to lead. Did that as much as his wealth, which he was considerably, you know, much more wealthy than he wasn't as rich as John Hancock, but he was uh, extraordinarily wealthy compared to other men of his age and his size. All that rolled into one made him a natural leader of the Congress. Is that fair to say? Or did he, or was he hampered somewhat by the fact that he, his reticence and his humility, whether it's true or false? No, I, I think the reticence and the humility helped. Yeah, he didn't annoy people. He, he wasn't grandiose. Um, they trusted him, but, and, and he had this talent for inspiring trust um, because he wasn't full of himself. Um, and so I think that actually uh, helped him a great deal. And yes, his reputation of bravery made a huge difference. Um, we respect people who are brave. Um, it's really, <laughs> it's really hard to face death the way uh, Washington did at uh, particularly uh, the battle uh, with Braddock at the Monongahela. And, you know, Washington was the tallest man on the battlefield. He was on a horse, which made him even more conspicuous. <laughs> um, most of the official uh, officers there were, were wounded or, or killed. Uh, they had two thirds casualties. It was one of the worst days ever in British military history. And, you know, he walks away without a scratch. So that makes him seem kind of mythical, um, sort of blessed. Um, but at the very least, people have to say, well, you know, the guy's, guy's got guts. Did he believe himself? Did Washington believe that he was saved by Providence that day to serve in a greater capacity? He writes a letter to his mom. It's kind of sweet that he does. And he describes it. And he does say, I can only thank Providence for having preserved me. And he expresses some, some wonder because so many uh, of the men were, were, were terribly hurt or killed. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think he thought it was, you know, some magical event, but he, he certainly beat the odds. And is that the letter in which, and I'm going to mangle this quote, something he writes, there's something bullets whizzing by, or was that another letter? No, that's an earlier letter to his brother. Um, and uh, it's after his first battle, uh, which is just a skirmish. And, but he, that's the one he won. And he does say there's something charming in the sound of bullets. And famously, King George II, right. um, the grandfather of George III, um, had that read to him because it was placed in the British newspapers. And George II said he would not say that if he had heard it very often. <laughs> I was going to say, that's what brings him to the attention to the British monarch, George II. That's right. It is. April 19th, 1775, so not long after the First Continental Congress, is when the shot heard round the world is fired. And Lexington Green, between the colonists and the British forces. What did Washington think of that event, and how did it cause him to act? Well, he thought the British were uh, entirely in the wrong, and that America had to fight. He was at the Second Continental Congress when the news comes of the battles um, and the reaction of all the delegates. Well, I mean, maybe not everyone, but 90% of them is, uh, okay, we're in it. Uh, we're going to have a war. And uh, 
that's when they start looking around and saying, gee, who's going to lead the army? Uh, and, you know, Washington just happens to be wearing his militia uniform at the time. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting experience to think about that. Uh, and they do agree that, well, maybe the guy in uniform is the right guy. And he is nominated to be commander in chief of the United States Army, if we can call it that. By whom? Uh, John Adams and actually uh, his colleague uh, from Maryland, Thomas Johnson, who was a good friend uh, and had been governor of, uh, of uh, or would become governor of Maryland. Uh, and Adams took full credit for it afterwards um, and said it was uh, really political in part, which of course it was, um, because it was a New England army that was being gathered up there around Boston. That's where the battle was. Uh, and the fighting would be. And so you needed a Southern uh, general and particularly one from Virginia, which was the biggest colony to ensure that all the colonies would join in the effort. Um, and I think that makes sense. And is there any evidence that, that Washington, other than wearing his uniform, which I'm sure was resplendent, uh, did any politicking that that's why he went to Philadelphia, that he sought some sort of command, if not the top command, he wanted to be where the action is? You know, at that Second Continental Congress, he chairs four or five committees all about military preparedness and readiness and how are we going to make gunpowder and all that, you know, they're suddenly starting to think about, geez, how are we going to fight this war? Um, and so it's clear that, you know, there are a lot of lawyers and, you know, merchants in the room and not a lot of military people. And Washington does have experience and he knows a bit about what he's talking about. And so he gets a lot of uh, deference. So even had he not worn the uniform, he might well have gotten the job. Um, but he made his availability pretty clear. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today is David Stewart, author of, among other books, but his new book is George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father. Washington is appointed commander-in-chief of the army of the colonies, for lack of a better term, and he goes to Boston, where after Lexington and Concord in April, the British and the New England Army are facing off uh, in Boston, Boston Harbor. He is there after the Battle of Bunker Hill, as I recall. He doesn't get there in time for that. But is it fair to say that Washington, we're getting ready to criticize uh, Washington's leadership as we go to New York, but at Boston and in that time, he deserves high marks for asserting command, for training, for trying to find supplies, in other words, make organizing something out of chaos so that it can serve as one unit. Oh, absolutely. He, he, he does bring some order out of the chaos. He is able to establish lines of command. Um, and he does uh, ultimately uh, come to the, the, the step that wins Boston back uh, which is to have Henry Knox bring the, uh, all the cannon that were seized at Ticonderoga and bring them to Boston so they can threaten the British positions. Uh, and, and that results in a, essentially a bloodless triumph uh, and the British leave. They're, they're not going for good, but they do abandon Boston and Boston is, is never troubled again uh, during the Revolutionary War. Washington's generalship, as much as we praise it for its ultimate outcome, how it influenced the war, certainly had its moments of significant criticism and, quite frankly, a poor performance on behalf of the commander in chief. I want to ask you a little bit about his successes, but let's 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 not bury the lead here. 
he had some terror. He fought some awful battles. He made some ridiculously bad decisions and he was saved more than once just by straight up luck. And I would define luck in this case, the timidity of the British generals who opposed him. What were some of those incidents where Washington didn't perform up to speed and just quite frankly got lucky? The, the battle in New York is, is the worst episode and it, it lasts for a few weeks. It's not just a, a single day. Um, he gets sucked into defending places he shouldn't be defending. Um, he, he wants to, and New York is a terrible place for him to be fighting, period. There's a pretty good argument that he should have just left and, and left it to the British because it was so surrounded by water that the British Navy was going to control all of the access in a way that would be very bad for the Americans. But he chose first to fight on what was called Long Island, really what is now Brooklyn, in uh, a, a bad situation. He did have a trusted general there, Nathaniel Green, who, who got sick and wasn't available. Uh, there was terrible coordination between the different uh, units that were there. It was a bad loss. And Washington really didn't seem to be in control of what was going on. Uh, he finally, he does realize after a couple of days that things are da dangerously bad and he realizes he needs to get out of there. And so he withdraws his troops and he does it in the middle of the night. And there is this providential, you, you could call it again, uh, it was Providence, uh, fog that descends upon the effort so the British can't see that they're leaving and that they're going across the East River to Manhattan. Unfortunately, in Manhattan, it doesn't go any better. Uh, I won't do chapter and verse, but he loses three or four battles. And finally, he does not abandon Fort Washington, which is a current neighborhood in upper Manhattan. Um, and the British take it. They capture about 3,000 soldiers and lots of supplies. It, it's really a, an awful day for the Americans. Washington has managed to get across to New Jersey with a bunch of his soldiers, but uh, it, it was a bad, uh, uh, bad performance. Um, he, and he, he fought the wrong battles in the wrong ways. Is that the first... And I'm guessing it is, but is that perhaps maybe one of the most fervent political, politically charged in a negative way atmospheres he has to deal with as commander in chief? You know, I think the the, the buzzards didn't start circling right away, um, both because it was so dangerous. It, it was a bad time. Everybody knew that, but also. Uh, we still had, the Americans still sort of had the glow of, you know, the independence and feeling brave about themselves. The, New York happens, the, the battles happen just a couple of months after the Declaration of Independence. And he is able to retrieve it within three months with uh, one of the most amazing reversals of history when he wins uh, at Trenton and Princeton. They are not giant battles. They're actually rather small, but they're terribly important for morale and for his reputation. Uh, he was not, I think, in danger of being replaced until then, although it could have been coming pretty soon thereafter, uh, just because, uh, and, and there was he no shortage. Of people he recognized there was a danger the army might just fall apart. Forgive me, Mr. Stewart. I was just going to say, and there was no shortage of generals who would have gladly taken his position. Uh, as you point out, uh, officer corps tend to have ambitious people in them. <laughs> <laughs> Trenton and Princeton, but sticking with Trenton, which is Christmas 1776 shows the side of Washington that he wanted people to see. 
in the sense that he didn't want to fight all these defensive battles. He wanted to be audacious and attack and win those laurels. I think not only for his personal reputation, please correct me, but also he thought that's how wars were won. That's traditionally how wars had been won in the 18th century. There's a great book called The Age of Battles by Russell Wigley, who's actually an Indiana University professor, that details that that starts with Bretton Field, 1631, 1632, goes all the way through Waterloo, which is 1815. But, but generals wanted to make their reputations by being audacious, by attacking, by capturing armies and winning those sorts of laurels. Washington was no different, and Trenton gave him that opportunity, much more so than some of these more defensive battles that he had been fighting so far. Is that fair? Uh, completely. Uh, he had... He had wanted to attack Boston, which would have been insanity. Um, he wanted to win a smashing victory. And uh, it, it's an ironic thing because in the French and Indian War, he saw the British lose every battle and win the war. And he had to, he should have understood better that you could lose a lot of battles and still win the war. Um, but his mindset in the early couple of years of the war was, was very much, um, he wanted to win it on the battlefield. And he tried to do it in the battles involving Philadelphia, whether well, it was Germantown, Brandywine, all the way up and through Monmouth Courthouse. But he wasn't able to do it. But what he was able to do was keep that army intact, despite Morristown, despite Valley Forge. How important was a Washington's presence? How important was that to keeping the army together? And B, how important was the mere presence of an American army? How important was that to keeping the war alive, especially when it comes to European support? After a couple of years of losing, the, the Americans got more realistic, the officer corps, that they really just had to hang around just had to survive. And sooner or later, the British were gonna get tired and it was gonna to get too expensive um, to keep armies fighting so far away. In the 18th century, it was massively ambitious to have armies uh, across the ocean. And it, it, with, with Washington, he, he comes to this realization uh, and it, it, it does begin to influence him. I would insist, actually, that I think Monmouth actually was a successful battle. Mm. Um, it had some messy moments, but at the end of the day, the Americans are in command of the battlefield, which they had never been before since Boston. And it, it made a huge difference, and it kept the army, it gave the army heart when they needed heart. Uh, and Washington's leadership through all the terrible winters they endured was essential. Um, he was able to persuade the soldiers that he cared and he was fighting for them and he was doing everything he could. And we have to recognize that these soldiers underwent hardships that we can't even imagine. Disease, lack of food, lack of clothes. Um, and they endured it largely, well, in significant part, just because of their idealism for the cause. And that should make us stop and think. And the mere existence and perseverance of the army was noted by countries in Europe. Oh, yeah, of course. And, and that we got credibility, you know, through this period, the United States of America exists only wherever Congress was, which, frankly, it, it was moving around to try to avoid the British. <laughs> I was just getting ready to say. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and, I'm sorry. Uh, they were on the run some of the time. Uh, and where the Army was, there was nothing else that was the United States of America. Was Mammoth the battle? Washington gets there, I'm going to say late, but he gets there kind of after it starts and it's going badly, then he takes command. But the American commander, was that Charles Lee? Was yes, he in Lee charge? Had, yeah, Lee had commanded the vanguard and had basically putzed around for six or seven hours in killing heat. 
and was retired, was leaving the field with all of his men. Um, and the British were hard on his heels. And Washington rides up and basically says, what in God's name are you doing? Yeah, doesn't he, he cuss does him out? The troops and he gets the high ground, which is essential, and uh, fights, him, fights him even. I thought I had read one time where like Washington, who, who were, were listing all his virtues, we should say that Washington was famous for a, or a Tyrannosaurus temper, which he fought hard to keep in check, but he screamed at Lee, Major General Charles Lee, who was a, 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 a cared more about his damn dogs than he did anything else. And whatever, whoever he was sleeping with at the time, it was an awful general, but had served in, I think in the British army or something like that. So he was held in high esteem but Washington cussed him out on the battlefield, sent him to the rear. Am I getting this right or wrong? Uh, partly right. Uh, there is some myth associated with this. I mean, Washington absolutely had a titanic temper that he fought his whole life to control. Um, and it's clear he lost it when he confronted General Lee, who was a very exotic and eccentric fellow, but pretty smart. And uh, there is an account that you know, Washington turned the air blue with his curses, but that account was written by somebody who wasn't there, who wrote it 20 years later. So it's pretty dubious. Um, it's clear that he was enraged and, and you couldn't miss it. But he had to rally the troops. I mean, the British showed up 15 minutes later. He didn't have time to stand around and scream. Uh, and, he, and he was able to do that. Uh, and I, I do think Ironically, Washington was better improvising his battles than he was planning them. His planned battles tended to be quite intricate uh, and not really to anticipate all the things that would go wrong, and, and they often did. Uh, but this was a moment where he was able to just seize that occasion and inspire the men and find the right place to be uh, for them to succeed. How much did it bother Washington that up until, and we're going to get to this, we'll discuss the surrender at Yorktown, which is October 19th, 1781, and then we'll move on. But up until that time, the biggest victory in the American Revolution was the Battle of Saratoga in September and October of 1777, which Washington did not win. He was not there. Instead, it was Horatio Gates. Well, it's mostly Benedict Arnold and Daniel Morgan, but but Horatio Gates is in command of the army, receives the surrender of an entire British army, which led directly to European intervention in the American Revolutionary War, without which the war would never have been won, in my view. But please, please push back on that. But did it bother Washington that Gates had won the signature victory of the war and he hadn't? He never said that, um, but it obviously did. You can see from his conduct. And all of the guys around him, Hamilton and uh, John Lawrence, all basically, and Lafayette, they all basically said, well, you know, a, a, a child of two could have won that battle in Saratoga. He outnumbered the British three to one. They had just slogged through the Adirondacks. They were exhausted, and poorly supplied. And, you know, it, it was no big deal. Um, clearly it rankled that the great victory had been won by Gates. And there was a move, it's called the Conway Cabal, and I do address it in the book, to put Gates in charge as commander in chief and replace Washington, which Washington very deftly pushes aside. Um, I think it shows his political skills very well. Um, so the, the Yorktown uh, battle loomed very large to Washington, and he really leaps at that opportunity. Uh, he, he can see that Cornwallis has gotten himself in a bad spot, uh, and he's got uh, the French with him, which is essential, as you point out. Uh, without the French, we probably don't win. Um, and also, the, there is a French fleet, which is able to screen off the British fleet. Uh, so everything breaks his way for Yorktown, maybe the way everything broke Gates's way for Saratoga. Uh, 
And uh, he does manage to capture another British army. This is the second British army that has been completely captured by the Americans. And it basically tears it for the British political leadership back home. This, is, this war is not worth it to them. Oh, God, it's all over, exclaimed Lord North, who was <laughs> the prime minister for George III at the time. The Treaty of Paris ends the Revolutionary War in September 1783. But perhaps one of George Washington's two of his greatest services to his country happen roughly around this time. One is I'd like to talk to you or would like for you to talk to us about he re resigned his commission and how he diffused the insurrection among his officers who were upset about back pay and respect and various other things. And yeah, those are great moments. And I think again, show his political talents uh, the Newburgh mutiny you're referring to uh, was a very dangerous moment uh, when the army could have turned against the government. And it's happening despite Washington. Uh, he's not supporting it, but he's very sympathetic to the officers who have not been paid uh, and have served in very difficult circumstances. But it gets away from him. Uh, they are saying things he finds totally irresponsible. And there is a meeting called of the officers that he basically hijacks. Ironically, Horatio Gates is in charge of the meeting, but Washington just walks in the room and suddenly it's Washington's meeting. And Washington, I think, shows how wise he is. He does not berate the officers. He tells them that he just is so dazzled by the sacrifices they have made. He is sad that they might imperil their reputations by rash actions. And then he tries to read a letter from a member of Congress and he can't make it out. So he reaches for his glasses and he says, you must forgive me. I've not only grown gray in your service, but I'm going blind. And he wins the day with that. Everybody is moved. Uh, they know the sacrifices. He's been in the field for almost eight years. He's been there every step that the army has been there. Uh, and many of the officers are reduced to, to tears. And they had not seen him in his spectacles. Sorry. They had, they had, excuse me. They had not seen him in his spectacles. He did not wear them. They were relatively new, as I recall, but they had never seen him like that. That's right. And he shows his vulnerability, which I think, again, is his, his ability to make that human connection. Forgive this next question, but just based on their performance during this period, didn't the Second Continental Congress deserve some sort of lashing? Uh, the con at this point, it's under the Articles of Confederation, so we call it the Confederation Congress, which um, it was a terrible, ah, terrible is the wrong word, a, a massively <laughs> ineffective body. Right. Um, they ha did not have the power to impose taxes. They had to beg for money from the states. The states didn't have that much money themselves and certainly weren't going to pass it off to these guys in Philadelphia or wherever they happened to be staying that night. Um, and so it, it was, uh, they had ch terrible challenges, but they did not show much leadership. Frankly, most of the impressive people of the American Revolution were no longer in Congress by then. That's, that's a great point. Washington resigns his commission in one of the most selfless acts. He could have done anything he wanted at that point in the United States. Why did he resign his commission? And what did he want the rest of his life to be like after he left the army? Yeah, you, you make exactly the right point. I think that was the single act that made the rest of his political career possible because he established that he didn't care about power. It wasn't, he didn't need it for its own right. And he just went home. There's the famous incident where some portrait painter tells George III that Washington has resigned the army and George kind of doesn't believe it. He says, well, if that's true, he's the greatest man in the world. Um, you know, we had kings and emperors and, you know, people who got power kept it. They kept it in the family. You know, Julius Caesar won wars and took power. Bonaparte would, Oliver Cromwell did. It's what you did. And Washington didn't. And I think 
it showed his countrymen that he could be trusted. And it was a terrifically powerful message. I genuinely think he did it because he didn't want to be in politics right then. He wanted to go home. He was tired. Um, he loved Mount Vernon and he'd fought for eight years and he just wanted to leave. And he had visited in those eight and a half, eight to eight and a half years, I think he had visited Mount Vernon like nine times, 10 times total. Yeah, the very New York town campaign. Uh, and uh, it, it, he, 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 he was just tired. <laughs> I think we've got to give him credit for that. <laughs> so he wants to retire and be a, a, a successful planter and a successful citizen, a prominent citizen. But as you mentioned a few seconds ago, the Articles of Confederation clearly were not doing the job when it came to welding the colonies together. Washington is a prominent voice uh, that calls for a new form of government, and this leads to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. Mr. Stewart has written a book called The Summer of 1787 about the creation of the Constitution. I have read it. And it is superb. If you love this period in history, please pick this book up. It's very concise. It's very well. It's actually it, the anecdotes in it are what make it so fun to read. Uh, Mr. You. Stewart really does a terrific job of bringing out the personalities. And, you know, you get any group of people together, no matter how bright or what they look like or how educated they are. And there's going to be problems in the Constitutional Convention 1787 uh, despite its ultimate brilliance, uh, certainly brings out those personalities. So of course, any place Alexander Hamilton is means there's going to be some sort of fight somehow, some way. How important was George Washington to the success of the convention just by being elected unanimously president, presiding officer of the convention, nominated by Benjamin Franklin, with whom I read a terrific book. I think it's by Thomas Fleming about uh, the relationship between Franklin and Washington and how Washington just really revered Franklin. Uh, and I, don't, maybe, I don't know if a father figure is the right term, but just thought so highly of him. And Franklin's efforts in Europe during the American Revolutionary War are just absolutely indispensable. Uh, but if Washington doesn't go to Philadelphia, if he says, I've had enough, I support what you're doing, but I'm going to stay at Mount Vernon, let me know how it goes. How different is the Constitution and how different is the convention? I think there's a better than even chance that the country doesn't become the United States. I think uh, there was open talk about dissolving into three separate countries, New England, the Middle States, and the South. Uh, there's a lot of forces pulling them apart, um, not enough forces pulling them together. And you know, there was one fellow who had the stature to make it happen. And what Americans asked after the Constitutional Convention basically was, is Washington for it? And if Washington mm -hmm. was for it, then it was okay for them. You know, and he had very few requirements from the Constitution. You know, he was not a guy to get into the weeds as to, you know, what should, should it be a two thirds vote or a majority vote or any of that stuff. But he thought it was just essential that Congress have the power to enact taxes that there be an executive branch. There hadn't been an executive branch under the Articles of Confederation. And that the uh, uh, government uh, had, that, that they not uh, allow the states to run wild, that their, the national government be superior to the states. Those were the three things he had to have, and he got them. Was it a foregone conclusion that he would be the country's first president? Yes. Everybody in the room thought so. Including George Washington? I think he knew that it was inevitable because by showing up at the convention, he had basically said, okay, I'm buying into this. And you know what I said earlier about sense of duty. I think he had a sense of duty that um, he would have been failing in his duty had he not accepted the, the job. Every so often, I think Arthur Schlesinger did it first, maybe in 1960, historians come together and rank presidents based on various factors. And 
Lincoln, as far as I recall, has never finished less than first, lower than first. He's always number one. Uh, Washington was number two. And then as you know, I think he's slipped a little bit sometimes, mostly behind Franklin Roosevelt. But is it overstating it to say that Washington does not get enough credit, not only for deciding to become president, but for basically creating the concept of president of the United States that we still know today? You just can't underestimate the value of Washington. It's the 20 years that formed the country. He was the guy he, and he was the guy whose vote always mattered. Uh, and I don't ever mean to denigrate Lincoln's achievements and accomplishments. Uh, and I would put them in a tie for number one because um, Lincoln's burden was huge, but so was Washington's and he, he met that burden, he really defined what we expect from a national leader in, in, a, in a wonderful way. Uh, you know, it, a lot of revolutions go bad and it was pretty much Washington who kept our revolution from going bad. I mean, usually there's some tyrant or there's some chaos that ensues and Washington is able to sort of walk that line between despotism. He didn't care for that. That's not what he was in it for. And chaos, which he despised. Um, he believed in order. So uh, we were extraordinarily fortunate to have him. For a leader, for a man, for a personality who despised and loathed factions and overt political maneuvering and machinations, how was it that George Washington presided over what is probably the single greatest intra-cabinet rivalry in the history of the United States? And I'm speaking of Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson and Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he thought they were extraordinarily talented people who had a great deal to offer the country, and he wanted them both there precisely because they were at each other's throats. A, it kept it in the family, and it wasn't out on the streets. Um, and B, it made him look like, it put him in the position he wanted to be, of hearing from both sides, of being the neutral arbiter who listened to and cared about everybody. And I actually think when Jefferson leaves the cabinet, uh, is when Washington really starts having more trouble politically because his government is no longer looking neutral. It's starting to look like Federalists, and that foments opposition. So uh, he, he desperately tried to keep Jefferson in the cabinet. Um, that's exactly what he wanted. Is it fair to say that Washington's sympathies ideological, philosophical sympathies were more on the side of Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists? It's a delicate question. He ends up aligned with the Federalists. Uh, they're pretty much the, the people who brought him to the party. Uh, but when he had, when Jefferson was in the uh, cabinet, Washington, you know, sometimes there would be conflicts and Washington would have to choose one side or the other. And he probably more often chose Jefferson's side, probably to keep Jefferson around. Um, so he, he desperately tried to play it down the middle. Uh, I think instinctively he was a conservative person. He certainly believed, you know, one of the great points of contention was, should we be siding with the British in this European war or with the French revolutionaries? Uh, the, lengthy European wars were just starting during his first administration. They last through his second. And he does not want to be part of that. Hamilton and the Federalists are with the British. The Jefferson and the uh, what he calls the Republicans are backing are identified with the French revolutionaries because they're revolutionaries and because they supported us in our revolution. And I think Washington's judgment, I don't think it's his emotions, I think his judgment is that it would be crazy to get into another war with Britain. 
um, that we have to make peace with them because they've got that darn Royal Navy. And that's very threatening to a maritime country like us. And so he makes uh, a treaty with Britain, which is very controversial, but I think was extraordinarily shrewd and wise. Uh, and that does cause Jefferson and his crowd to be very angry and, and to oppose uh, Washington's administration. We did a podcast with a famed Lincoln historian, Harold Holzer, and his, about his book called Presidents and the Press. And he talks a little bit about Thomas Jefferson's funding out of the State Department of this this horrifically anti-Washington rag. How did Washington, and I know the answer to this, and I hate to give you the softball, but how did Washington view the press? And what was his reaction to having his fellow Virginian, uh, someone who had been a friend of his for decades, fund and be a part of something that was so vicious? Well, that's one of the occasions we know when he really lost his temper. <laughs> um, and he may well have turned the uh, air blue with his curses. Apparently, he carried on for 30 minutes at a cabinet meeting. In a letter, when he don't not calm down much, he wrote, he referred to the uh, newspaper people as infamous scribblers, um, which is a wonderfully contemptuous term. <laughs> uh, and he, he was, uh, but he felt betrayed. Uh, and he thought these uh, newspaper people were not patriots and were, were wrong. Uh, and, and so it was a bad experience for him. Uh, by the time he leaves the presidency, he is really desperate to get out and to go home. He, he's not in, he does not enjoy his last couple of years as president. He served one term, and it's fair to say he didn't necessarily want to run for a second, but couldn't figure out who would replace him. And he had several people saying, hey, look, we need you for another four years. How close did he come to running for a third term? Uh, not close at all for a third term. And I would claim and, and do in the book that, you know, he was desperate to leave after the first term. I think he probably figured out that he'd had a pretty good run and the second term might not be so good. And one of my favorite uh, pieces of Washington uh, information is uh, his inaugural address uh, uh, for his second term is the shortest inaugural address in history. It's, a, it's four sentences long. Um, and he basically says, uh, uh, I'm honored that you've chosen me again. Uh, if I do anything wrong, you can impeach me. I'll see you later. Um, that's, <laughs> I, I, I say in the book, it was barely civil. I mean, he clearly didn't want to be there. And, and his friends had talked him into it. They've said, you know, there's nobody else. You got to do it. So he did it, but I, I don't think he wanted to be there. The last few minutes we have on the Leaders and Legends podcast with author and historian David Stewart. We think of the, the greatest addresses, written or spoken, uh, in American history. And Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence and Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and his second inaugural address and most of the things Lincoln said are always on the list. Um, you could think of maybe Franklin Roosevelt's inaugural address in 1932, uh, John Kennedy's in 1960, the list goes on and on. But contemporaneous to the times, and we may have forgotten it now, Washington's farewell address after leaving the presidency was rightly exalted as a beautiful piece of writing, which we should say was basically ghostwritten by Alexander Hamilton to a large degree. How important was Washington's farewell address as a piece of history and as a piece of political advice? And what was in that address? I think it was terribly important. It, it was to Washington, but you know, it was the sort of thing that uh, schoolboys for the next 60 years had to commit to memory and, and recite. Um, 
And I wish people read it carefully today. Um, it, it's a little long, and that's probably why people don't. But he has a number of very wise elements. But the most important to me is his discussion of partisanship, um, which he felt was running rampant. And most people agree that the 1790s was a really bitter time. Uh, and he says, of course, human beings are going to be partisan. That's just who we are. That's going to happen. But we can't let it get carried away. That when that happens, suddenly you're, you're not thinking anymore. If you take power from your opponent, you reverse everything they did, even if it was a good idea. And then he takes power back from you and he reverses everything you did, even if it was a good idea. And sooner or later, you end up with somebody who decides, well, I'll just take power. And you have a tyrant. And it was a very sophisticated appreciation of where partisanship leads that I think we have to be careful about in, in our era as well as in his. And his understanding of it and presentation of it, I just found extraordinarily powerful. I should have also mentioned Eisenhower's, President Eisenhower's farewell address uh, when he left the presidency. What is Washington's greatest political achievement? And by political, I mean small p, not big p. The United States of America, uh, that he was able to take the government sketched out by the Constitution, and anybody who's done constitutional law knows it's just sketched out. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> play in the joints there. And build something that could stand. Uh, he, he was part of this creating the structure of the Constitution, and then he was central to making it work. And that was the job he took on as president, and I think he performed it while, as I said earlier, modeling what a president should be. And that, I think, has had a wonderful effect on American political expectations. I mean, we haven't always had wonderful presidents, and I won't list sure. names, but it's more than a few uh, we could regret were president. But we've always known what a president should be like, and he always looks a lot like Washington. Is it fair to say his greatest failure was in not figuring out either at the convention or while president how to handle the issue of slavery in the United States? Yes. Uh, he understood it, especially after the war, where he had black soldiers who suffered and died for his liberty, and he understood at a core level that his participation in slavery was, was a crime. Um, he tried to get out of it personally. He advocated behind the scenes to do something about it, but he was not courageous about it. He did not step out in front. Um, and there was a notion among the founders in that era that somehow slavery was gonna just disappear. It was such a terrible thing, we would just stop it. That turned out not to be true. Uh, and uh, he, he certainly could have done more. Uh, he freed his slaves in his, his will, the slaves that he owned. It was the most he could do. I think it was an act of atonement a personal act. He said, I, he, he wrote at one point, I trust this would not displease my maker. Um, but it, it certainly didn't change the course of history as maybe he had hoped it would. George Washington died on December 14th, 1799. He was eulogized by Light Horse Harry Lee, father of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Light Horse said he was first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. He was second to none. Mr. Stewart, we end the Leaders and Legends podcast with the same five questions of all our guests. 
Are you ready? <laughs> They're painless. I, I, I promise. Good. First question. What was your first job? Uh, uh, newspaper reporter for the Staten Island Advance. Number two, what was your first concert? Oh, my. <laughs> uh, might have been Arlo Guthrie. That's the first Arlo Guthrie reference we've had on the Leaders and Legends <laughs> podcast. Five questions. I was, I was a geeky kid. <laughs> Well, you're in New York, right? So everybody comes to everybody comes to New York City. Good for you. Uh, number three, if you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you choose? Oh, this is going to sound off the wall, but the books I have loved most are actually the, the spy novels of John le Carre. I think they're brilliant studies of human nature, and they're also just compelling stories. So... Maybe you don't walk away a better person, but you will have had a wonderful time. This question will be particularly difficult for you, so I apologize in advance. If you could witness any event in history, be there as it happens, which event would you choose? Hmm. Well, I, I think... Uh, because I, I, I wrote about it and was so moved by it would be the time uh, when John Adams took his oath of office as the second president of the United States and Washington uh, observed a peaceful transfer of power. And when he goes out in the street, a crowd follows him in awe and in silence. That's I think we know now that the greatest applause is when people are struck dumb and they follow him till he gets to the president's house. It's just a couple of blocks and he turns to face them and he can't speak. He's so moved and he has tears coming down his face and he, all he can do is wave to them. And I would like to have been there for that. Last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record to talk about anything you want, whom would you choose? <sighs> if I was a, if I was an actually seasoned podcast host, I would be describing the anguish on Mr. Stewart's face as he tries to answer these questions. So <laughs> forgive me. I spend all this time in the 18th century. I'm not thinking about the people today. <laughs> <laughs> we have some people around whose minds are still in the 18th century. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I just, uh, I, I'm going to punt on that one. I, I don't have a good answer. George Bush, Barack Obama, I, Jimmy I Page. Be, I would be tickled to uh, spend time with either of them. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by... Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today has been David Stewart, author of the new book, which is a featured choice for the History Book Club, George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father. Mr. Stewart, thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed this discussion immensely. Thanks very much, Robert. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Mm-hmm.